Okay, we're back now with our last session of the day. So excited to introduce James Lop Lop Lopata, um, VP of Coaching and Vision at ASUP to uh, run this last session for us. Thank you. Great, so we're thrilled to be here. Um, we've got an amazing panel here. We're gonna be talking about the building blocks in particular um, for, for building your, your diversity, equity, and inclusion cultures. And we've got an amazing panel. Um, I'm gonna have each of them introduce themselves uh, with a couple of um, sentences about themselves, and then we're going to go through, and each one will give a, an important block uh, that you can use to build your um, your culture. And um, so, why don't we go in order of the the blocks for the introductions, and then we'll and then we'll do the blocks afterwards. So, I'm going to ask uh, Kiami, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, James. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Kiyomi Lewis, and I lead people and organizational development at Toast, which also includes the diversity, equity, and inclusion function. Prior to Toast, I led teams in HR and global diversity and inclusion and talent management across a couple of industries. Most recently, I was with PIMCO, which is asset management. I also worked with uh, Facebook, Microsoft, and New York Times before Toast. And just for context on this conversation, Toast does, um, we focus on serving the restaurant community. So we, we serve large and small customers and we offer a range of technology that combines point of sale, front of the house, back of the house and guest facing technology. So really happy to be here. Thanks. Terrific. And next up in order is David. Hello everybody, David Delmar Diaz here his. I am the founder and executive director of an organization called Resilient Coders. Uh, it's a very highly competitive, free and stipended nonprofit coding boot camp for people of color from low income backgrounds here in Boston. Uh, we train uh, folks up for careers as software and connect them with jobs as such. Uh, we are uh, very much focused on uh, the economic well being uh, of our Black and Latinx residents here in uh, Eastern Massachusetts, uh, concerned with economic parity uh, and justice. And so our, fo our work is uh, focused exclusively on on that. Terrific. And last but not least, we've got Reed. Hi, everybody. Reed Bundy. And uh, I have the privilege of being the final panelist in a two hour session over lunch. Uh, and so I'm super impressed by the uh, continued engagement here. I think that's just the sign of the, the fantastic panel. That. So I'm happy to be here. I'm, uh, I'm with Mindcast. We're a cybersecurity company. We focus primarily on uh, on email security, on uh, uh, cyber uh, cyber education uh, for organizations of really all sizes. Uh, my focus is on social impact, the employee experience, and uh, and also diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and really, my focus is to ensure that our focus on cyber resilience ties directly to our commitment to community resilience and, and ensuring that we are doing all we can to serve. So organizations that know not only are our customers, but, uh, but the markets that we, uh, that we live and that we serve. Happy to be here. Wonderful. And uh, I'm uh, James Lapata. I'm the Vice President of Coach Supervision at ASAP. We are a coaching company that provides coaching throughout organizations at scale, uh, affordably. And uh, I'm a coach supervisor, which means that I oversee kind of the larger vision or how we coach entire organizations uh, to leverage coaching for the benefit of all, for the uh, benefit of value creation. Um, part of my background, I've worked on Wall Street for several years in digital consulting. And um, I'm also the board president for the Massachusetts LGBT Chamber of Commerce. I've been very involved in diversity, equity, and inclusion issues for many, many years, um, particularly in the early days of Wall Street before there were even uh, employee resource groups. Uh, which uh, I've got several battle stories, but we're going to focus on the the um, panelists today. Uh, we've got three amazing panelists, and um, we've had to like call down their amazing knowledge uh, to one <laughs> item each. And uh, the 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 first building block. Uh, let me go through the three of them just briefly. The first building block will be from Kiami, which is uh, a building block around foundation. David will then. Uh, give us a building block around sustaining and uh, growing. And Reed will complete us with a more external facing building block around corporate social responsibility. So Kiami, could you share with us your first building block and maybe some sort of relevant way that uh, people could apply it? Sure, definitely. So building any foundation poses a couple of really um, 
important questions and decisions to be made around exactly what are you doing? <laughs> what are you trying to build and how are you going to know when it's finished, right? So in this space, um, uh, the questions that come up all the time are, how do we move the needle on diversity, equity, inclusion? Where do you start? How will you know you're making sustainable progress? And how do you know that it, you, you, how, how do you get it going in a meaningful way? And, and these are all questions that I think many of us have been grappling with over the past few decades, particularly um, I, I'm going to offer a couple of very tangible, tactical things that more than likely are not going to be rocket science to many of you who are involved in this work or thinking about this work. But before I do that, I'm, I'm also going to share three different approaches because I think that that is the most meaningful nugget that I'll pull, pull from my experience in the past because three of my companies took a very different approach to this. And I think they all worked but they came at it from a different way. And that might be the thing that is the thing. <laughs> so I'm gonna do that first. Um, so <laughs> the, the first company Great. was incre like incredibly focused on a targeted systematic process for driving and measuring change in key areas. We, we did that through the use of a maturity model that help measure and direct our efforts as we move through the, the phases. And that's the piece that I'm gonna focus on where you'll get a lot of the actual tangible things that you need to do. But the point is, was really looking at the, the process and as an evolutionary process while simultaneously meeting each business group where it was. So really the, the nugget there is looking at it in its whole and building out what you need to have in place. So things that would drive representation, inclusion, business impact, build it all out at once. The second company took a different approach where they said, you know what, we can do all that stuff, but it's really focused on transparency, accountability, and saying the hard stuff that nobody's saying. And I'll let you try to guess which company said that because I'm not gonna tell you. But the point is, is that they took a, the bull by the horns and said, look, here's what happens. Let's talk about this in a very raw and distinct way. We're only gonna focus on the four things first that really matter. They have to do with hiring, promotions, and the biased things that happen there. And we are going to unpack that like nobody's business. And then, you know, we'll still bring up the rear with the data and employee resource groups and all that stuff. But we're going for the jugular with this and we're going to hold people accountable. And then the third group, the approach was really around speed, agility, quick decisions. They went straight for client and customer impact, which I thought was just remarkable. <laughs> and the speed at which we did it was remarkable. Employee empowerment and engagement was remarkable. Again, all three and, and many others that I've talked to have, have taken some of the, the foundational blocks that I'll talk through in just a moment. But the approach is just as important as what you do. So how you do just as important as what you do. And I think each group got to where they needed to get in a different way. But again, one focused right for the juggler, one went transparency and accountability, and one said, let's build the house. So in building the house, the, the building blocks that I would say are, are really, really critical are having a mechanism for data and analytics. You need to be able to measure what you're doing. You need to have a cadence and uh, for communicating outcomes. The things you're measuring are representation. Who are you hiring? How are you moving people up, down, and through the organization? You're also inclusion. How are promotions, transfers, employee engagement, retention, equity? How are all of those things happening? How is it aligned with the policies that are out there? And then finally, there is the business impact, the customer act impact, the external impact. Who are you partnering with? How are you driving innovation, flexibility, and capabilities? And in those spaces, you need your leaders involved. The other thing you need are, is a strong learning platform. So in building out your foundation, you need a foundation for basic awareness and bias training, everything from that all the way up to your targeted learning um, initiatives. For example, one of the ones that we use for talent acquisitions managers was how to help them influence hiring managers to make the hires that you needed to make that you were measuring. <laughs> so little things like that to look at the full learning um, capacity for building capability. And then the, um, the other piece that I would say is really ensuring that you do have that employee involved, engagement involved. And I'm not gonna talk about ERGs and DEI councils because I think they're coming next, but those are definitely a piece to think about. What is the role they're gonna have? What decisions will they uh, make? What budget will they have? So how do you set them up? And then finally, the external focus, how are you engaging with vendors, your recruiting partners, your community, and your customers? So it really is a full-on package. As I mentioned, the maturity model is 
that I've seen, you can work through all of those things because they give you little indicators of what to do in each box. But having all of those in place and determining how you're going to tackle it is what I would suggest. That's wonderful. I, <laughs> amazing. So much out there. I have one, uh, one follow-up question. So you talked a lot about the metrics, which, you know, of course, we know is really helpful to have the evidence behind it. And I, and I work with a lot of growing companies. And, and so some of the companies you've worked with are huge. They have huge budgets. So when you think about metrics, sometimes it's hard to get all of those metrics initially. What might be something that somebody could focus on pretty easily to start off with? I know it can be sensitive to ask employees you know, about their diverse backgrounds and stuff like that. What might be a metric that people could really grab onto and start to work with first? Yeah, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right. And, and I'll say this, you know, a lot of our early metrics were in Excel spreadsheets with glue and paste. So trust me, we didn't have the fancy stuff when I first started. So you can do this, okay? I think a lot of the HRS systems actually have the, the metrics in there. They have the tool to capture that information if people decide to do it. But some things you can do, even if you don't collect diversity, um, uh, all of them, things that you can take a look at is as you're going through your talent processes, as you're looking at your succession plan, are there diverse people on the talent succession plan? Are there key people? What percentage are they? You know, one of the uh, recommendations that um, one of the companies had is as you build your succession plan, you had to have two people on there that were different. Like you don't need any metrics from that. <laughs> I know who my son is. Right? I know if they're different from me. And so that was one thing. Does Do all of the succession plans have two people on there that are different from yourself that could be ready in two years? And how are you developing them? It's very simple. Um, as you're bringing um, candidates in and people transition from applicant to candidate, what does that pool look like? You know, who's on the, the, the panel that's interviewing and who's on the candidate pool? We know that if you have more than one on the candidate pool, there's there's the odds of actually increasing the diversity. So some of those things, you don't need like highfalutin <laughs> metrics to do it. Um, but if you have them, it really does help you parse out how individuals are experiencing your culture and experiencing all the processes within your culture. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So that's setting the foundation. So we're going to turn to David now. And so we're starting to get people in. We're starting to make sure that I've got different people around me. How do I sustain this? <laughs> How do I get real empowerment? How do I hold people accountable, David? Yes, on? great questions. Um, <laughs> so first of all, shout out to metrics. Having a metrics-based assessment of how you're doing in terms of <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's wild how often that sort of escapes the, the conversation. And uh, thank you, Kiami, for, uh, for all of that, and especially for, for bringing it back to metrics. Um, I always say that if a company is in business, uh, it knows how to set goals uh, and achieve them, right? Um, so uh, I also celebrate the fact that nowadays we have some leaders that are that are really taking it upon themselves to think differently who and how they hire and advance. Um, but this is not always the case. Uh, something that we experience here at Resilient Coders, um, by the way, a, a big part of the function that we do is, is connecting our graduates with jobs. And so this we spend a lot of time in this particular part of the funnel. Um, and one of the comments that comes that that comes up uh, from random employees is, "I wish my company were hiring differently, uh, but what can I do? I am but a lowly software engineer, right?" Uh, and so one of the things that we have been uh, focusing on is, what does it look like to talk to employees and really foment an employee-led movement, right? Organizing from the ground up establishing a groundswell, leadership hears it. Um, ideally, there's a conversation to be had where leaders say, oh, this means a lot to you, that's awesome. Um, sometimes it is the case that, uh, that that leaders are really not at a point where they're listening to it. Uh, and so uh, the employees have to come together, really organize and agitate um, to borrow some language from community organizing, right? They have to sort of agitate and express to their leadership that this is just not a negotiable thing, uh, that this really means a lot to an activated employee base. Uh, and so I think that uh, A, employee engagement is absolutely critical in the uh, the scaling of anything that has anything to do with DE or I, right? Um, and often it is actually the very beginning 
uh, one of the steps that we real that have happened in the past with some leaders is that they establish a sort of like kind of tokenized uh, DE and I program uh, that is really not really E or I, right? Um, and so uh, what some of our activated employees have been pushing for is uh, recalibration of power, right? Is, is our program predicated on the recalibration of power or is it tokenizing, right? And then figuring out uh, what it would look like to come up with frameworks of accountability. Um, I can't, I don't think any of us have time uh, for me to sit here and talk at length about what that looks like, nor does anyone want to uh, uh, forestall their lunch any longer than they have to, to listen to me go on and on. Um, but one of the things that we have found is that most folks uh, who present resistance to a groundswell of activated employees are either don't want to or don't know how. Uh, and so we, we tell all of our uh, activated employees, you got to recognize folks for who they are and where they're at, whether it's don't want and don't know how, and work with them, incorporate them into part of your process. Um, and uh, I'm happy to, if anyone has questions about this, I'm happy to sort of post a link uh, into the chat in terms of like a living document that we're starting to pull together based on the conversations that we're having like this with activated employees at different companies. Um, and also I'll throw my email out there too, because I can talk about this stuff all day long, but I won't do right now. So th this is great. And I like the emphasis on metrics and, and really employee agitation. So I'm, I'm curious, can you share like a, a little success story about how this has worked effectively with the employees really taking the lead? Uh, absolutely. Uh, most of the time, pretty straightforward. It's uh, an employees get together as a group um, we always encourage folks to find each other first, so it's not just one person. Uh, folks find each other and they approach leadership and they say, look, this really means a lot to us. Uh, we really want to see this happen in the media, you know, Megacorp LLC. And more often than not, the CTO of Megacorp will say, that sounds great. Let's do it. Usually they put it back on the employee um, and say, all right, so what would it look like to craft such a thing, which is awesome. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't it doesn't happen, right? And if it doesn't happen, uh, that's when we get into the realm of like petitions uh, and organizing. Uh, we did have uh, one of our companies recently. Uh, they actually circulated a petition uh, and presented it to um, to their leadership and said, "Look, this this really means, and we're just not going to take no for an answer." Uh, that is thankfully the uh, not very common, right? More often than not, leaders want to do it. Most people, in my experience, are of the don't want to, don't know how. Most people are don't know how, right? And they are sort of like allies in waiting um, who just don't really know how to make it happen uh, and would love to engage their employees such that they build a pipeline or a product that everyone is bought into and excited about. Great. I can visualize that. That's powerful. Thank you. So, Reed. Can you take us a little more externally now? So you, you do a lot with corporate social responsibility. How does this begin to create an outward facing uh, or, or how does this begin to move outward in organizations and why is that important? And, and tell us, you know, a building block that you suggest. Yeah. So for starters, I don't even want to be a panelist. I just want to sit with them at David and Kiyami. So I'm frantically taking notes here. So, but I guess, I guess I'm already, I'm Maybe already locked too. in here. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think to start, I, I guess one kind of uh, point of clarification or context setting is to, to never conflate CSR and I, right? And, and while with, with my team, I, I happen to oversee both of those functions to, to employee experience, I think it's a real danger to, to move it to, to start sort of using them interchangeably, right? Because certainly, um, you know, we see DNI as a, 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 a core. Uh, ingredient to our success and to differentiating us. Um, and and I think that's where it really, it, it gets back to, by the way, is anyone getting feedback? Because I'm getting one. A little bit. You're, you're breaking up a little bit, right. but I think we'll, we'll probably we can hear you well enough. We're getting the, the content. Okay, good. All right, well, just raise your hand. Um, so for my team, they're really, they're, they're three legs of the school. There's the employee engagement piece, corporate social responsibility, yeah, I've got individuals who oversee each of those ones. So we really see those as concentric circles, where there's not always going to be total overlap, but they are absolutely critical to one another's success. Um, and so, you know, David talking about getting that ground work from employees and ensuring that it's, it's really grassroots in nature. 
Absolutely, 100%. Um, you know, and so when we look at our CSR programming, to give a little context, so I've been with Mimecast for just under a year. Um, I left a company that had exponentially higher CSR budget than where I ended in Mimecast. And we have some budget, but um, but the fact that I did that, I had a lot of people say, like, why, why would you make that, that change? And it was because what I saw in the culture and in the commitment to really thinking beyond kind of the, the writing the check and checking the box and sponsoring the gala, really weaving it into the, the business model, the differentiation, um, and weaving it into what we do in terms of how we support our employees, how we grow up with people, we find new talent. Uh, and really reinvest in the in the community that we, uh, that we live in, that we work in. Um, you know, I, I, I like to call out that um, we are a, we're a South African company. Roots, roots from South Africa. We are, um, we, you know, we were founded 14 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, and and there's there's no question that, that racial disparity is, is uh, obviously part of uh, South African history. And it's something that we we continue to, um, to to hold close to us as we think about build out our program, as we think about uh, our our nonprofit partnership in each of our markets. So our primary markets are here in Boston, in London, in South Africa, in Australia. Um, and so that really rings true in, in who we partner with, who we partner with them, and then kind of going beyond the gala, right? Um, we we try to find those partnerships. And that can really reinforce this idea of building more resilient communities, building a, a stronger, more diverse workforce. So a couple of examples that I'll give you. So we work with Europe, awesome. um, fantastic organization, the national scope. Um, and frankly, I don't really, well, galas don't really have this, but I don't really care about the galas. I care about how do we create that, that shared value? Um, and not only support an organization that is, is uh, you know, throughout Boston, the country. Um, but frankly, how does it benefit us, our business and allow us to grow as an organization? So um, we've, we've brought on multiple interns. We've recruited uh, one and hopefully a few others from Europe. Um, and we're constantly looking for those periodically. We're constantly looking for those types of partners. We could really uh, expand our confidence and, and really. You know, I love the, I love the, uh, you know, the, this idea of kind of really honest conversation. Go for the jugular, right? I think that was the end, right? Um, so, so with that, I'll actually just pivot quickly to the DEI side of things. I think it's important. Um, so we're right in the middle of that going. Um, we we have a head of DNI in March, um, and we're going through the full audit right now. So I get the, the shout out to what we're in. The um, and and taking that hard look and, and kind of owning the fact that we got a lot of work to do and and tech in general as we all know has a lot of work to do. Um, loved uh, Chevy is opening comment talked about um, the misinterpretation of of, of, of Jackie Cochran. That's important and to me. That, that's the type of honesty that we all need to have. I'm not going to stand here and say that we're we're crushing it when it comes to DEI. We are not. But we're but we're focused on it and and we're committed to, to these um, ones. Great, uh, Nela, you're you're in. Should I? Can I ask a follow up question or where are we at? Okay, yeah, we're right at one o'clock. Uh, James, go ahead okay. and ask a follow up question to wrap it up, and um, we'll end this. We just want to be very cognizant of everyone's time. Thank you all. Go ahead, James. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, one thing: the um, somebody wanted to double check your three concentric circles. I think they were employee engagement, CSR, and DEI. Okay. So, in terms of value, you talked a lot about creating value, and I'm curious, like, you know, what is the value that is really created? Like, why do we do this? What is what is the value to the company? What is the value to the customers? Kiami began talking about how one of our companies really focused on the client. What do you see as the value to really doing this? For a company, I mean, you're 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 there to you know raise revenue and, and to do things for the community. What is the value? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for for from a business perspective, for me, the the bottom line is about right? and and uh, not only finding the absolute best talent and and, and finding talent from uh, a, a far broader spectrum of 
a lot of tech companies like that. But the reality is, you know, none of us are really going back to the office in the next months, maybe ever, right? Um, the What differentiated tech companies a couple years ago, pool tables and beer carts, ping pong tables, what differentiates companies now is, is commitment to, to truly walking the walk to, to being a purpose-driven organization particularly when you look at millennials, particularly when you look at the fact that there's not a lot of turnover right now with a lot of these companies, um, you know, given given the environment. So, um, yeah, I mean, strictly from a business perspective, this is an opportunity to really showcase that we are a perfect organization and we're, and we're committed to it. That's brilliant. I want to thank everybody. Um, I learned a lot. <laughs> there's a lot to apply here, but it was also very targeted. So I want to appreciate the panelists. Uh, thank you, Nayla. And I'll turn it back to Nayla. Yes, um, thank you so much, James, Reed, Cami, David. This was really a dynamic group, and I want you all to know it was fantastic having meetings with them and pulling this content together. I mean, they are in it; they're all in. So, with that, we are going to wrap up. This is our final session of great content. Um, thank you so much to this panel. Uh, I'm going to talk to everybody out there who's left. And there's a, quick, a bit about, there's still a lot of you left. We are aware that we promised some networking and we wanted to kind of push it to the end. I know it's right a little bit past one. We are going to uh, keep the forum open. If you're interested in speed networking with everybody here, you just have to click the little networking button on the side and it will put you in. It's automatically generated. Um, you'll be matched with whoever's in there and you'll have four minutes. You will have the option to accept or decline. Nobody will know. <laughs> so with that, panelists, um, I think we're finished. Thank you all. There will be a lot of follow-up with follow-up content and um, enjoy your day. Thank you, Mila. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Great.